Now our next speaker is Dr. Stefan Caddy Ritalik. He's an adjunct lecturer in the School of Biological Services at the University of Adelaide. His work focuses on the effective management of ecosystems in the face of climate change. He has particular interests in urban trees and in bridging the gap between scientists and government. Earlier this year, the Uni of Adelaide was commissioned by the State Planning Commission to review the urban tree protection rules across Australia. Please welcome Dr. Stefan Caddy Ritalik. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, that generous welcome. Gosh, there are a lot of you. <laughs> So I was asked today to come and talk about best practice tree protection. What does that look like? Um, and that was in response to uh, some of the work that the Conservation Council has done, that, uh, that Craig and Joanna talked about. Uh, I was part of a team from the University of Adelaide that was contracted by the Attorney General's Department, uh, Planning Land Use Services, to um, look at the work that they'd done and say, you know, is, is it as bad as we're, we're suggesting? How can the South Australian government um, reform our tree protection laws. Now, when you're looking at trying to come up with good regulations, good, good ways of achieving things as government, regulation is only one part of the picture. Regulation is really important because that tells us what to do. But we also need to have strong economic drivers. We need to make sure that uh, we're not creating perverse economic incentives, that people can't um, make money by doing something that is, uh, is against the interests of society. And we need to bring people along with us because we don't want to live in a police state. We want people to believe in the work that we're doing. And if you don't achieve these three things, then you don't manage to get good policy. You don't get good outcomes. So, when we had a look at the South Australian tree protection laws, we looked at 101 interstate metropolitan councils. So these are councils that are similar to Adelaide, or the, the, you know, the metropolitan councils of Adelaide, and we found that about two thirds of them used at least one size base protection for protecting trees. So 52% used height-based protections. They said if a tree is a certain height, then it automatically becomes protected. Half use circumference-based protection, like South Australia does. And just over one-fifth use crown-spread-based crown -spread protections. And the most powerful approach is probably to use a combination of these, because there are some trees that will never reach two metres or, uh, uh, or will never reach a certain height, but these are still worthy of protection. So if we have a look at uh, circumference protection, because this is what's used by, uh, by South Australia, uh, this was used by half of the councils uh, interstate, and 78% of them picked 50 centimetres or less as the circumference at which a tree is uh, protected. 95% said if it's a metre or, uh, or, or greater, then we will protect it. And one other council, one council, um, said if it's 140 centimetres, that will be the threshold. South Australia sits out here at two metres protection. If we have a look at height, um, each one of those, uh, those vertical bars there is one council interstate, uh, and this was actually the most popular way of protecting trees. It's a little bit trickier to measure. You don't just need a, a measuring tape uh, around the base of the tree. Um, so the best way to do this is with a laser, uh, laser range finder, um, but you can also do it by estimating the heights of uh, nearby structures. So power lines, for example, are at about eight metres. People are about you know, 1.6 to 1.8 metres high. Um, so you, you can estimate that reasonably well. Uh, South Australia doesn't use this one at all. Um, we found that um, yeah, most, most councils were using uh, tree protections of about four metres. Crown spread. Crown spread uh, was used by about 20% of councils, not used in South Australia at all, just like height. Uh, an average of about 3.5 metres uh, crown spread, which is not very big. You know, that's probably from here to the wall away. So we're talking about reasonably small trees. This is pretty easily measured by pacing out on the ground, um, but one huge benefit of this protection is that you can do it from Google Earth or, or Google Maps, you know, any of these sort of free online platforms. It can be done remotely. Councils can easily do it. Uh, it's also very easy to enforce for that reason. One thing to be aware of um, with uh, this measure is that trees can, of course, be pruned and, and often, often do need to be pruned. Um, so, um, 
particularly also with deciduous trees, it can change a little bit, which is another reason why combining these methods is a really useful approach. So what does this mean on the ground? Uh, it's easy to imagine a range of reasons that you might want to remove a protected tree. For example, it might be in your backyard and it might be undermining the foundations of your house. You know, that's a, a reasonable reason to say, I might want to remove that tree. In Adelaide, any regulated or significant tree that is within 10 metres of a house or in-ground swimming pool, except for a eucalyptus species or a gonus flexuosa, is exempted from protection. So this little house that I've, I've drawn here, um, that's got a pretty generous frontage of 20 metres, um, and we can see that uh, together with the house and the pool, um, nearly all of that house is, uh, is exempt, or all of that property is exempt from protection, which is very similar to the uh, um, examples that Joanna and Craig shared with us. Interstate, a minority of councils uh, generate a two to three metre buffer from houses and significant structures only. So these aren't carports and backyard sheds and things like that. These are, these are houses. Swimming pools don't usually get a look in. Uh, three metre uh, generated clearance, so much smaller. In that situation, all of those trees uh, would be protected. And the majority of councils interstate don't use any clearance envelope at all. And you need to demonstrate that a protected tree is having a significant impact on a structure in order to apply for it to be removed. So quite a different um, state of affairs. Uh, effectively, what this means um, in, in Adelaide is that only a, a tiny proportion of suburban homes are really able to um, support protected trees without any exemptions. And we'll see what that looks like in reality shortly. So looking at species protections. Uh, so most jurisdictions, uh, more than 90% around Australia, um, exempt, uh, exempt some species from protection. These are usually because they're weeds. Uh, they're things like olive trees or willows, species that we don't want to protect. Um, but every one of the, these are the species that we exempt here in South Australia. Um, and every one of those species will have its detractors and every one will have its defenders. And I can guarantee that every one of those has the capacity to be a high value tree in some circumstances. Maybe not everywhere, um, maybe not in bushland, but certainly in, in residential homes. For example, uh, desert ash, uh, Fraxinus there, um, that's widely it's one of Adelaide's most widely planted street trees. Um, and it's planted by councils because it performs well, it's a great shady tree, um, and while it does have a propensity to get into waterways and become an invasive species, in a backyard it's very unlikely to cause a problem. One of the big reasons that species exemptions are problematic is that trees are actually really hard to identify. This tree here is a, uh, was identified as a spotted gum. Uh, it's in a, was in a house at, uh, at Beaumont. Uh, and earlier this year, um, because it was a spotted gum at Carimbia, um, it wasn't um, able to be, uh, it was within 10 metres of the house. It wasn't protected by the eucalypt law um, and it was able to be removed by the, the homeowner. Unfortunately, following the removal, it was determined that it wasn't a Carimbia maculata at all it was actually a eucalyptus saligna, and that tree was illegally removed. Now the arborist, it was a professional arborist who was responsible for the uh, tree identification. Uh, that arborist was fined uh, $5,200, which was less than 5% of the possible penalty, um, and uh, goes to show just how easily it is to you know, make a, a whoopsie mistake uh, and clear a fantastic tree. For this reason, I think that in the urban environment, species exemptions should be treated very sparingly. Um, that's perhaps different in a regional environment or a peri-urban environment, but certainly in the suburbs, uh, I think that's a, a difficult one to um, get good results with. There are lots and lots of others. Uh, this report on the right here, Urban Tree Protection in Australia, a review of regulatory matters, was contracted by Planning and Land Use Services. Uh, and in that report, my co-authors and I um, address a whole bunch of other ways that interstate councils protect trees, uh, using planning-based overlays and protecting trees in certain locations, uh, protecting particular species with, with higher thresholds, uh, regulating the arboricultural industry, which is currently largely unregulated. Uh, any one of you could uh, decide that you're an arborist uh, tomorrow and go out and, uh, and start uh, practicing as an arborist. Uh, economic instruments, so this is charging bonds and fees. Uh, empowering local governments to, uh, to make their own local laws for tree protection. At the moment, this is all state government rules in South Australia. Uh, methodologies for valuing trees, tree protection registers, 
and penalties. And this is both monetary penalties, but also things like shaming signs. And there are a range of uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, approaches that are used interstate and overseas. So if you're interested in those things, go read that report, because I don't have time to talk about them now. So I promised that I'd uh, give you a bit of an indication about what this looks like on the ground. Uh, so under the current planning system, there's very little economic value that is put on a tree. In fact, in many ways, trees are worth negative money. There's a huge incentive to remove a tree if you're undertaking any type of development. So this is, uh, this is two properties in 2015. I've highlighted three regulated trees there. Uh, and this is those two properties uh, seven years later. Now, um, on the, in the upper property there, they're likely regulated trees. Um, the, uh, the, um, they're within 10 metres of the dwelling, though, so they're not uh, protected unless they're eucalypts or Agonis flexuosa. Uh, for the um, lower trees, um, they're possibly unregulated. All three of these big trees could have been retained in those de uh, developments because they're on the edge of the properties. You know, they're not smack bang in the middle. It was possible to build houses around them. Uh, but retaining the trees in those situations would have meant that a, a tree exclusion zone, a tree protection zone, would have needed to have been established. Um, it would have been uh, restricted, uh, moving earth moving uh, machinery in there. Those trees would have had to have been maintained. It would have met, meant development was more expensive and slower as a result. Um, so uh, instead, uh, the proponents in that situation uh, removed those trees. Uh, they paid a few hundred dollars uh, for the application and to pay into a, an offset, scene, uh, off get, offset scheme. And what this means is that we've got a, a huge incentive for developers to remove those trees, not just you know, work around them. They're much better off removing them. Here's another, uh, another property. This is in Adelaide South. Uh, so this is a corner block um, that was purchased and divided into three. Uh, so there was certainly an opportunity to retain those two eucalypts out the front of the house there, um, but uh, it would have been difficult to divide that into three blocks. Um, if two blocks had been, um, had been divided rather than three, it would have been relatively straightforward to keep those two trees with a, with a driveway. Uh, if we look at the, the blocks that exist now, there's not enough space in them for large trees, uh, and there is nowhere on any of those properties that a tree could exist uh, and not be exempt from current protections. So how could this be improved? You know, what, what would best practice tree protection look like? How would we stop this from happening? Well, we could introduce a tree protection system with bonds based on the projected value of the developed land. So, that block there, that corner block on the left, that's about uh, 2,500 square metres. And of that, about, um, 200, about uh, 500 square metres of that is covered by the canopy of those trees on the private land. Before the subdivision, the property was valued at about $280 a square metre. Now, it would be reasonably straightforward for councils or state government to project the value of that land after subdivision. And it would be something like um, $560,000 um, $560 per square metre um, once this development had occurred, once this subdivision had occurred. So it roughly doubled in value. Now, if we were to multiply that figure by the area of those trees on private land, that would give us a figure of $280,000, which is not actually very... Uh, it's reasonably consistent with the value of mature eucalypts um, that is uh, used by the uh, City of Melbourne, FIRE methodology, these tree valuation methodologies that exist. So the council or state government could say to that developer, if you want to remove those large trees, we would like you to pay into an offset fund of $280,000 because that's what those trees are worth. Or pay a bond for the protection of those trees. Once your development is complete and those trees are, are healthy and retained, you can have your money back. That would take away the economic incentive for the developer to remove those trees. They're still free to develop the land uh, and to make money by subdividing and building new properties, um, but it would mean that they have an incentive to remove the, the trees, or at least no, disin no incentive to remove them. So going on to the social issues, trees are a real nuisance. Um, they are a pain. Um, this social stuff is really important to address, and it's really easy to forget this stuff, but we really do need to, uh, 
do need to think about it because trees cause people problems. They drop litter on the ground, gum nuts, I really like this, you know, council knew of gum nut dangers. <laughs> Uh, they, they drop litter in, uh, in gutters and pools. They drop resin on your car. The roots can lift pavement. They also shade solar panels. One of the number one council complaints that people get is the trees are shading my solar panels. I'm losing out on money because of your trees or my neighbour's trees. And this leads to a really strong NIMBY vibe. I love trees. I love trees. But it does drop leaves in the gutter. Not in my backyard. So there's a really clear role here for government to play in educating the public and not providing incentives for perverse outcomes. So coming back to the, uh, the solar panel example, solar panels pay about five cents per kilowatt hour um, in terms of uh, feed-in tariff into the grid. So the value of selling electricity is not that high. If you have a standard five kilowatt system, you might get three dollars, you know, a few dollars a day um, on sunny days uh, if your uh, panels aren't being shaded at all. Shade from a tree can be up to 10 degrees cooler than shade from any other structure. Not the difference between standing in the sun and standing in the shade. I'm talking about shade from a shade sail or a building versus shade from a tree. And that's because trees transpire and they have a transpiration effect. Uh, that, uh, that, that evaporative effect means that trees are a lot cooler. So that means that if a tree is shading your house enough to dampen your solar panels, it is also shading your house enough to keep your house far cooler in summer. So any um, money that you're losing from not getting quite so much feed-in tariff, you would be more than making up in summer where cooling costs are 30 to 40% of your electricity bill. In addition, of course, we reduce the impact of power generation and we increase the carbon sequestration by locking up carbon dioxide in that tree. Then, of course, there is fear. It is amazing how easy these headlights, uh, headlines are to find. Trees cause about five deaths per year in Australia. And it's actually really difficult to define what a tree death is because, you know, if I climb a tree and the branch breaks or I fall out of the tree, it counts as a tree death. So given how very many trees we have in Australia, South Australia, Adelaide, not so much, uh, it's, it's amazing that we don't see more deaths from trees. They are tremendously stable, uh, stable structures you're approximately two to three times more likely to die from a lightning strike, about 43 times more likely to die from an assault, uh, and about, tw about uh, 240 times more likely to die in a car accident. The risk assessment for each individual tree is based on an arborist assessment. That's an arborist going out, oh yeah. Um, it's not benchmarked against um, the actual rate of tree failure in Australia. And that's work that's currently being undertaken um, by various insurers, uh, the um, um, arboricultural uh, peak bodies and, and others. Um, but it's a, it's a huge problem because we tend to overestimate the risk of tree failure, uh, particularly in sensitive areas like schools. You know, just because there's a child underneath a tree um, doesn't mean that it's more likely to fail. Trees, uh, trees also tend to fail in periods of high stress, which is not usually when people are sitting under them. I'm talking about storms. People don't tend to sit outside under trees in, in these kind of events where, to store, where trees tend to fail. So prestige and education. Established trees are really hard to move. You can't buy them. You can't go to Bunnings and buy a mature tree. I used to watch people trying to transplant big mature palms around Adelaide. Every now and then you still see it. Usually they die. It's super expensive. The failure rate is high. So there is a prestige uh, associated with them. They reflect the history of the house, the history of a community. And people tend to want to preserve old houses. You know, they, they say, this is a lovely old Federation house or a Victorian house or whatever it was. I want to protect this old banister. I want to protect this wrought iron door, whatever it might be. Why not so with trees? This is some work that we could do. There's a huge correlation between wealthier suburbs and health, but it's not recognised that we assume that that's because rich people get to go to the doctor more often. That's probably true. But it's also to do with the fact that um, these greener neighbourhoods uh, are associated with higher urban biodiversity, higher green spaces, um, and that is also a huge driver of health. There is a huge correlation between exposure to green, uh, green spaces uh, and better respiratory, gut and psychological health. People who live near trees live longer, have healthier lives, are happier. Adelaide has spent a lot of money becoming a national park city and has some very, very passionate people at Green Adelaide, one of whom is sitting in the front row. So let's empower them to educate our community about trees. It's the easiest sell in the world. 
if we choose to, uh, to make, that, uh, make that case and to share that passion that we have. Speaking of lots of work, local governments and the state government have spent a huge amount of time and effort over the past 10 plus years generating these documents. This, this took me about 30 seconds of Googling to pull up these documents. There are, there are dozens more of these. Um, there are all of these tree-focused documents, strategies, plans, aspirational targets that have been produced to achieve a green, highly livable city. This is something that we all want. It's very, very popular. However, all of these documents are overshadowed by these documents. These are the acts, regulations and directions that are produced by the state government that present trees as a threat. You know, trees fall over, they damage infrastructure, they, uh, they carry fire, um, they, um, they get in the way of our power lines. And if these documents aren't harmonised, then we will never see um, a, a step change in our tree protection because we will have these documents that overrule any of the aspirational targets that we have. The Planning, Development and Infrastructure Act is a really important one because as many of you would be aware, there's currently a uh, review going on of the um, Planning Implementation Code. And uh, recently, um, the expert panel that has been convened um, to look at that um, produced a discussion paper in which they explicitly said they will not be looking at tree protection methodologies, nor will they be looking at, at, uh, at making recommendations about the exemptions um, to those methodologies. So they've explicitly said, we will not be touching this stuff. Um, so if that's, the, if that's the case, and that is how the uh, planning implementation review proceeds, then certainly we won't see any harmonisation between these documents. As it stands, the scope of that uh, needs to be increased a lot in order to get the alignment between these documents that we're going to see, in order to um, get the kind of, uh, kind of harmonisation we need to get better canopy outcomes. I've given you a, a couple of ideas about how that could be achieved, but it really needs to be comprehensive across local and state government um, strategies, plans, uh, acts and, uh, and regulations. So I've given you a few teasers um, as to uh, how we, we went today. I'd really like to uh, thank the Conservation Council for inviting me today. I'd like to thank the State Government for sponsoring this work and giving us the opportunity to put it all together. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Ricky Belder and Kate Delaport, who have been fantastic advocates uh, in all of this space. Uh, and I'd really like to leave you with that quote. Uh, a smart city is a city where humans, trees, birds and other animals can grow with all their glories, imperfections, freedom and creativity. They are not just cities of technology, but cities of love, life, beauty, dignity, freedom and equality. Thank you. Would you plant a red gum in your backyard? Well, we did as a commitment to the future and to this bit of Ghana land. Being a responsible guardian of one of the biggest and grandest of the original Adelaide Plains flora is definitely a commitment. But it's been a joy and a revelation sharing this family home with a tree that began as a small seedling and is now a significant tree with a circumference of over three metres. It's now 31 years old and an island of both attraction and value to a diverse array of passing wildlife, including crows, magpies, currawongs, sulphur-crested cockatoos, wattle birds and Murray magpies who have nested in it for years. Occasionally a koala turns up and spends a day or two resting in its crown. There's always something going on up there. Sharing our lives with this tree and all the wildlife it attracts has been one of the great joys and the ultimate payoffs of giving up this part of the garden to this original Adelaide Plains tree. It's a living connection to what once grew across our suburb. When the big gales blow in from the southwest and the tree roars and sways, I think of the day that we planted it and wonder if it might fail. But at 31, it's not even a teenager by definition and it bends and bears the brunt and is still there in the morning. Neighbours love our red gum in the golden hour when the western sun lights it up and highlights its mottled boughs and trunk, or when it's full of birds calling in the first light of dawn, or the haunting call of boo books high above in the depths of the night. Its trunk is so huge now that I can't really hug it anymore, just embrace it. As I do, I take pleasure in whispering to it, but I will protect it and fight for it as long as I'm alive. It's the least I can do after the pleasure and happiness, as well as the understanding it has given to us.